would have the power that I need to present your word. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. So there was a pastor struggling to make ends meet on his first call and the salary that's come with that. So he was livid when he confronted his wife with the receipt for a $250 dress she had bought. How could you do this? Well, I was outside the store looking at the dress through the window, and then I found myself trying it on, she explained. It was like Satan was whispering in my ear, you look fabulous in that dress. Buy it. Well, the pastor replied, you know, what I, you know how I deal with that kind of temptation. I say, get behind me, Satan. I did, she replied. But then he said, it looks fabulous back there, too. <laughs> Like, I'm not sure how many people expected me to be in Joshua this morning and how disappointed you might be in regards to that. But you might have noticed last week that I felt like I wanted to cover something I just didn't have time for. And it really is a good balance to the messages that we've had on forgiveness. You know, when we think about the forgiveness of God, again, how he says in terms of our sin, our disobedience, again, he's willing to clean the slate. He's willing to not allow that to be a disruption in terms of our relationship with him. But it's important for us to understand in the context of all that, that God would desire for us to have victory over sin, to recognize the dynamic that is often happening within in terms of the temptation that we face and how we would negotiate through that in our understanding of him, of sin, and the temptation that we face. So one person did ask in terms of a topic, just when does sin start? Like, well, what is the beginning of sin, if, 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 if you will? And to me, that naturally leads us to James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. So when does sin become sin uh, in James 1, 13 through 15? So it says here, just reading through it, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So notice first uh, that it, this is a when and not an if. You know, when we think about what we would otherwise desire of the Christian life, we'd like to think that we wouldn't be tempted, that there wouldn't be this thing from within and without that is drawing us to do things are wrong, but to realize that as the reality of the Christian life in terms of what God says we will have to confront. And it's always impressive to me that God is always honest about what the Christian life is going to look like, and temptation is going to be one of them. But I do believe that there's consolation and hope in that, and the fact that the reality of temptation being the thing that Satan and sin would engage us in, we see the next slide that tells us that it's a clear affirmation that the sin nature and Satan are powerless yet still present. In fact, I mean, to, to realize that the only thing they can do is tempt you is, is good news in terms of the fact that before Christ, they had complete control over you. The, the, the Satan is actually described as the father of the world, like people who are outside of Christ have no power to overcome him or go a different direction, no power over sin. And so again, God's plan is that Sin is powerless to us, that the only thing it can do is tempt us, it can't control us, it can't dictate things to us, but he still wants our free will to be engaged and have the choices that we would make, but to realize they cannot make you do anything. Sin and Satan cannot make you do anything. That as a believer in Jesus Christ, the choice will always be yours and there'll always be an opportunity for you to go a different way because God will always be present to direct you in a different way. But we have to understand that the dyna dynamic that happens in our lives is that we will be tempted. We will be drawn. There will be desires that rise up in us that God ultimately wants to help us with. The second thing we see here is a great declaration about the character and nature of our God. And when we recognize that God cannot be tempted by sin, and he does not tempt anyone, that ultimately there's no way that God can be corrupted. There's no way that God could be influenced to, do, to ever do anything bad for you or to you. I mean, that's a great thing for us to understand about God. 
That whenever God is doing something to us in terms of engaging with us, it's always to our benefit. It's always to our progress. He's always trying to help us. I really love that song that we sing in terms of just the line that I've heard a thousand stories about the way you are, but I know who you are, God. Like, like in other words, when we think about even the temptation that is in the world, just understand the world is buying a bunch of lies. It's buying a lot of deception that Satan is promoting amongst the, the, the people of the world. And so they are always looking for ways to discredit God to, God, to dismiss God. But again, the thing that we affirm and the thing that we know in our hearts is the truth of who God is and the fact that he is a good father. Again, he can't even be convinced. There's nothing in him that is corruptible in his nature. So again, James affirms that here. So no intent or action toward wrong desire. I mean, certainly there's no place also to rationalize sin as God's will. You know, I think it's a, whether or not it's James' intent to say this, but some people might actually promote sin as God's will. Like, no, it's God's will for me to do this thing. I actually had a Sunday school teacher once you know, come to me and say, it's, it's God's will that I'm leaving my wife and going this, with this person. You know, so the, the pastor after that put, brought all the kids in his office and said, what did he say? And that's not true. And, you know, but that's the level of deception that can be in us. So again, James just wants to make that clear right off the bat that God never tempts and he can't be tempted by evil. Yet, although God, God said, will not tempt us, as James says, James has made clear above and the rest of scripture affirms that God will test us. See, he's never going to tempt us but he will test us. I mean, just ask Abraham um, in terms of go sacrifice your son Isaac. Never God's intent, never God's will in terms of that. But God wanted to bring Abraham through that process to understand what do you believe about me? What do you know about me? So God does not tempt us, but he will test us. In terms of the next slide, and when we talk about God's testing in James, it is for the development of perseverance in 1 Peter 1, 7, it is to show the genuineness of faith. You know, in terms of just what we believe and what we know about God, in some ways we never know what we truly believe until that faith is tested. Amen? Like an, an, until you're challenged to love someone that is hard to love, you don't know if you love the way God loves until you're challenged to forgive in the way that God would have you forgive, you don't know if you really believe in God's forgiveness. And so therefore, the tests are given there to show us the genuineness of our faith, to develop perseverance in terms of knowing that God's way is the right way, and it's always the right way. And so as we continually make those choices where, again, God, I, I am following you, God, I do believe, you are right, you are true, and, and then we gain traction with that. That's where James eventually says, you'll be able to handle anything. Like, like, like once you're willing to believe God, once you're able to follow God, anything can happen in your life. And you'll still be on stable ground. You'll still be okay within yourself in terms of just your knowledge of God and believing in him. And really, any student will tell you tests are important. Okay, let's be honest. Every teacher will tell you that tests are important. <laughs> but isn't that true? Like, like in other words, that the, the teacher to giving a class, you know, they're, they're teaching this information. They're, they're explaining science or they're explaining math. This is how algebra works or this is how geometry works. Well, until you have the test, you don't know what you understand. Or certainly the teacher can't know what you understand. See, now the interesting thing to me is that God always knows where your faith is. God knows exactly what you understand or don't understand, but he wants us to know. He wants you to know where your faith is. Like you might think your faith is great, and then you have a problem, you have the test, and oh, it wasn't that great. Or you think your greatest, your faith is small, and then all of a sudden you face this situation. Boy, I had a peace that passes understanding. I had, a, I had a, a will in terms of making the right decision here, where maybe in the past I've made a wrong decision, and now I see myself believing God and trusting in Him. And so again, there's, there's you know, there's, that's what the tests are there for, again, for us to see where our faith and 
What's, in, what's interesting about God's test is both success and failure can be valuable. Like, in other words, when I, when I find out that, yes, because of the test, because of the temptation, I believe, I'm obedient, I'm doing what God wants me to say, I'm guarding away from the lie, I'm clinging to the truth. Well, now, again, that success is affirming to you. Well, on the other hand, if you fail... That, that's also revelatory to you. Like, again, I thought I had the faith. I thought I had learned obedience. I thought I was going in the right direction. I guess I've got to build up my faith. I guess I've got to build up my knowledge. I've got to build up my understanding of who God is and what he's seeking to accomplish in my life. See, but to me, there's a stark difference between the temptation and the testing. See, the temptation and what's, what the distinction I would want to make in terms of this slide is that temptation is always encouraging evil. Like when Satan or the sin nature comes along and tempts us, it's always to an end that we are disobedient, that we're doing something opposed to God. Whereas the test is giving us an option. Ultimately, God's desire is the test would prove that we are faithful, that we do have the will, we do have the faith to be obedient. But again, it's important for us to know that. See, I think we have to understand that God is always trying to build us up in faith. God is always trying to mature us. God, God never desires for the Christian life to be static. Do you realize that? That, that we never, we never fail, come to, to a time where, okay, I, I don't need to grow anymore. I don't need to read, any, read anymore. I don't need to pray anymore. I don't need to go to church anymore. I've got it all figured out. What? Like the minute you think that's the case, you can come up here and you can be the pastor. Well, when you figure you've got it all figured out and you know everything you need to know, okay, well, then you can preach the messages and I'll sit down and I'll learn from you. But to realize God is always desiring us for, for us to grow. So, therefore, for him to provide these tests to show us if we're growing, are you progressing? See, it's, a, it's the neatest thing when that you see that you are. Like this thing that you did fall into, this sin that, you, that has been hankering you for, for, for your life. And all of a sudden, now you are victorious. Yes, I do believe you, God. Yes, I am going to rely on your resource. Yes, I am going to do what you want me to do. And that's a great affirming thing that God would seek to accomplish in our lives. And so, that it's, so again, first we have that it's, it's, it's a when, then, and if, a great uh, affirmation of God's character. He's not going to tempt us, but he is going to test us. And the third thing we see there, here, is that although James makes clear God doesn't tempt us, he doesn't share who does. And I, and I think James does that because that's not his emphasis. Like, he's not concerned about who is tempting us or where it's coming from. He's more concerned of what we do with the temptation but if we're thinking about temptation, we have to recognize the three enemies that the, the rest of Scripture points to that are the sources of temptation, and that is Satan. He is actually called the tempter. It probably would be fair to say that he is the primary source of temptation. But then we have the world, and we have the sin nature. So again, we have things inside of us that are encouraging us to do wrong, and we have things outside of us encouraging that things to do, do wrong. And so we have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of the influences that we subject ourselves to. You know, I know that being on time is not a very popular thing at Living Hope Christian Church, but as I read the psalm this morning, I chose a psalm that talked about, you know, I don't sit with the mockers. I don't sit with the deceitful. I don't sit with the sinners. Like, it's, it's amazing to me that we are, we are supposed to be influencers we're supposed to hang out with unbelievers so we can shine the light of Christ, but we always have to be concerned about how they're influencing us because we just have to realize that that's a tool in the kingdom of darkness's plan to lead us away from Christ, to lead us away from godliness, to lead us away from the things that would cause us to grow in Christ as opposed to walking away from him. And so therefore, to, to, to see that, the, the, like, those influences are there. Like, it's not, it's not an accident that people don't believe. <laughs> like, it's not an accident that the world is going in the direction that it's going in. 
Like all, all the things that are broken about what the, the way people perceive things and the, the things that society is promoting. And again, it's rejection of God. It's dis dismissing the word or dismissing Christ or calling us narrow-minded or whatever it might be to discourage our faith. You just realize that that is intentional. You know, we, and we have to watch out for the influence that is there. I think particularly for the young people. You know, for, for those people that are in middle school and high school, really in college as well, you are in the throes of it. And in terms of all that society is promoting that is disqualifying and dismissing God. That basically showing that God either isn't real, or he doesn't matter, or he's just flat out wrong. And using things that are subjective and subjective in nature to convince you that he, he shouldn't be followed, he shouldn't be clung to, he shouldn't be believed, and he shouldn't be promoted. And you have to understand, it's a lie. And as you walk away from God, it's a lie. You're believing a lie. When you think about the things that support the truth of God, when you think about what supports my faith in Jesus Christ, it's the power of creation it's the power of the life of Christ. It's the power of the cross. It's the power of the resurrection. It's a conviction of the word. It's the work of God throughout history that is my authority. Now, what is yours? Your feelings? Your friends? You know, who's that Hawkins guy? Stephen Hawkins? Like, he, he's your authority? You're going to reject the God of creation? Be, be, because some scientist says, I found this thing that says this. And when all this other evidence points to a creator God. See, see to understand that when you, when you walk away from God, or you walk away from the Bible, you walk away from Christ, you walk away from the cross. Again, you are denying that very reality that you are created by someone. There's a, there's a personal being out there that cares about you. And has a way that you should live. And recognizing that he wants to be connected to you. So therefore, everything that he has done is drawing you to himself. First, that's in relationship. Then it's in obedience. And to be obedient, we have to understand what the Bible is saying here. To be obedient, we have to understand the influence of temptation. The reality that it's there. The provision that God gives us in the midst of it. But to see it for what it is and, and, and expose it, its harm to us. And so again, we see that's the, again, the, the source of the temptation. But then fourth, the thing we would want to look at in this message is, 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 is it, it is wise for us to consider the nature of temptation. And what I have here, it is always a proposition to think in a way different from God's way that often leads to saying or doing something wrong. It defines and defends its own interpretation of truth. Its first goal is to get you to believe something wrong before having you do something wrong. I, I, I want you to think about the sin that so easily besets you. I, I want you to think about the thing that always trips you up. Is the thing that always, more commonly than not, the thing that Satan is bringing up and tempting you, it's that thing. And just think about how that engagement is. That ultimately he's first talking about your thinking. What are you thinking? What are you believing? What are you knowing? You know, what, 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 are, you, what are you recognizing in terms of who God is? What are you recognizing in terms of what God has said? What are you, what are you thinking about other people? What are you thinking about yourself? See, the thing that temptation is always trying to do is rationalize and justify. Rationalize what you're doing isn't wrong or justify why you have a right to it. But again, it's first talking about thinking, the way you're thinking, the way you're processing things, and that's where, that's where it, it, it hits you. And, I mean, we have to understand it both promotes the negative and blinds us to the positive. You know, in terms of what it is promoting, what is what it is proposing. Again, it's first and foremost an offer. You know, it's only it's you can almost picture it like it's a salesman. You know, you know, have you ever bought something that at first you didn't want to buy, and then a salesman convinced you to buy it, and then you bought it? 
Like, like that's what, if you've ever been in that situation, you can come up and give your testimony about how, you know, but like, but to, to recognize that, like that process could happen. But see, you can go to a point where you don't want to do something, then someone comes and speaks something and says certain things and defines certain truth. Now all of a sudden you're, you're, you're going in that direction. And that's the way, that's the way temptation works. It, it, no, I still want to do the, it promotes the negative and blinds to the positive. You know, we, we understand that, that the, like that te- aspect of temptation that's about evil, you know, that temptation that's about, okay, this is the sinful thing, and you, you know, God doesn't want you to do this, but I want you to do it. And so there, here we go in terms of, you know, following my dictates and my direction rather than God's. But we also have to understand that temptation also blinds us to the positive. So, so in other words, when, when, when we think about all the things that God would say about us, Satan doesn't want us to believe that. So Satan is always distancing us from God. You know, think about the garden and what he does with Eve. Did God really say that? You know, to discrediting God, discrediting his character, discrediting, discrediting God's purpose and why he's giving them the standard to not eat the tree. God really didn't say this. And by the way, he's trying to harm you. He's trying to keep something from you. Well, in many ways, Satan's tax, uh, our attacks are, are the same. And his tactics are the same in terms of what he confronts us with. But again, it also blinds us to the positive, blinds us to God's love, blinds us like does to God's truth. See, it's always redefining thing, things. And I think the, the biggest thing it's always trying to redefine is who is God and what has he, has he said. In terms of how much you believe that thing in terms of what God promotes. But when you are, when you are insecure... When you are discouraged, when you are discontent, like all those negative emotions are a primary tactic of the kingdom of darkness to come and blind us from the things that God has provided. Blind us from the things that are true. So, well, I'm not, I'm not committing sin. I'm not, I'm not hurting people. I'm not lusting or being greedy or being prideful or whatever, but like I'm really sad or like, I'm, like, really discouraged about life, or I'm really insecure, like, I have a hard time believing that I'm God's child, and being affirmed in that, or, you know, being enveloped by his love and his purpose in terms of the truth he would have to encourage me in the situation that I'm in. You know, there's always a place in God's economy for us to be built up in who he is, what he has said about us, and the provisions for our lives. And Satan is always trying to blind us to that. Another part of temptation is the fact that it always focuses our attention on the fruits and not the persons, the kingdoms, or the consequences. And it's always, it's always talking about the apple, even though we don't know there was an apple. It's always talking about, look at the fruit. Look at the benefit that's going to come from that. Look, look at what I'm offering you in terms of how gratified you're going to be if you go this way. But it always brines you to who Satan is, who God is. The fact that Satan is always trying to destroy us. He's always our enemy. He's always trying to pervert things in God's economy to lead us away from God. But again, his character is evil His character is destructive. His character is death. God is glorious. God is loving. God is true. God is powerful. God is all-knowing. God is merciful. God is gracious. Do you ever remember that when you're sinning? Do you ever remember that when you're being tempted? No, because he's blinding you to that. But look look at the apple. But what about God? Don't forget about God. Just look at the apple. Isn't that the way? See, I'm... I know what this is like. Like, this is not me as a pastor. Well, you guys have to learn what temptation is like, and you need to be better in obeying God and understand. No, I'm there. I, I know evil desire, and I know what it's like to be dragged away and enticed. But, but to come up with the truth of God and affirm God's character, who he is, and why he should be the one followed, 
He should be the one that I'm, I'm seeking to grow in. So it blinds us to the persons and the kingdoms. Again, when you live, when you sin, you're promoting the kingdom of, of, of hell. You're, you're promoting the kingdom of Satan. And, 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 and promoting his work. Like, yay, I, I want Satan to win. <laughs> Every time you sin, you're saying, I want Satan. I want Satan to have more influence in my life. So I can be more a representative of his than I am of God's. He blinds you to the kingdoms. Again, the, the opportunity we have in obedience to join God in terms of what he's promoting in the earth. And that's what, well, that's what obedience leads to. And then the consequences never tells you the truth about what's going to happen. Ne never, never tells you that if you do this, if you make this decision, this is how you're going to feel. This is how it's going to affect your relationships. This is how it's going to affect your soul. That you're going to become more and more dark in terms of what you're understanding. And again, that's the nature of temptation. The fifth thing that we see, uh, I don't have time for this. Next slide. I thought I wouldn't have time for that. Fifth, James squarely puts the responsibility for response to temptation to us. When it says here, but each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. See, in that, in that way, the source really doesn't matter. I think, I think the reason why uh, James, as he says, God doesn't tempt you, but here's who does, that's not his focus. His focus is accountability. His focus is responsibility. His focus is, you know something, regardless of where the temptation is coming from, you have to understand the problem that's within you that links up to it. So in some ways, it doesn't matter where it comes from. You know, certainly if you are one that would focus attention on that, like, oh, where's this temptation coming from? Is this coming from Satan? Is this coming from the sin nature? Is this coming from the world? And you're getting pretty... Uh, Sandra's like, forget about that. Look at your evil desire. <laughs> well, look at the thing that's now reaching out and grabbing hold of that temptation. You know, I think the truth and the reality of this is really affirmed in the fact of how we think of things that we're tempted by and we're not tempted by. You know, if you've been around long enough, you know that I do not like liver. And so if you came to me with a big plate of liver and said, oh, look, pastor, don't, don't you want to eat the liver? You want the liver, don't you? Come and eat the liver. No, I'm, I'm not. See, I have no evil desire for liver. But I, I don't have any good desire for liver either, I guess. But you get my point that, that the reality of what James is saying here is the thing that gives temptation power is the evil desire within you. That the fact that, that, that Satan is, is pointing to something that he knows you're going to be tempted by. It's, he knows it's going to be something that trips you up. But to recognize that what is coming externally from us now is coming, it's hitting something internally to us that we are then responsible for. See, I think it is important to recognize that the evil desire is not sin. Like part of the point of this message, part of the point of this passage is when we talk about temptation, we talk about evil desire, those things are not sin. But they are the things that lead to sin, and so therefore we need to be watchful over those things. But for us to say to ourselves, like, I can't believe I thought that. I can't believe I desired that. And I think what happens is that Satan actually takes the temptation and desire and defeats us at that point. And makes us feel bad about the fact that we are being tempted and we have the desire. But what God says is that's not that's not when sin happens. That, that is you being enticed. That is you being drawn in. You know, the picture here really is a fisherman. It really is someone that, okay, they set the lure and they put out the bait. And, okay, come on, follow. Come on, you can do this. You want to do this. I'm here. That, that's what it's like. But the fact that the bait's there, the fact that, oh, look at that worm on that hook. That looks good. <laughs> Again, that, that is not sin. 
Now, I think there is a point for us as believers to watch how much evil desire we have. I think part of growing in God, being in the Word, being under the Spirit, being in the fellowship of believers, all those things should be encouraging us not to have those evil desires. Like, it's a good thing if, if those aren't present or they're becoming lessened. But if you have evil desire and then say no, see, that's the point. Okay, I'm being tempted. Satan is making a proposition. This looks good. Forget about God. Forget about his purposes. Forget about the consequences. Do this. And you say, no, I don't believe that. See, don't forget, I don't believe that. It's not just about, I'm not going to do that. I don't believe what you're saying. I don't believe what you're saying about God. I don't believe what you're saying about me. I don't believe what you're saying about the implications of this or other people, whatever it would be. But I'm pointing out the lies for what they are. And then I say, no, I'm not going to follow that. No, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to replace that with something that is of godliness rather than of sin. And so, so even, though, even though the evil desire participates with the temptation. It's not sin in of itself, but like I said, we should be, growing in Christ should be about lessening that. But we can't, we can't feel bad about having the desire. Like I remember a time in my life where I was really dedicated to memorizing the word of God. And, you know, I was at a campus and my undergraduate degree and a lot of walking going on without a car on campus. And I, I redeemed the time. I started to have car, note cards where I'd have a verse and then the reference on the back. And I still remember verses because of that discipline that I established in that context. But I'd be you know, going along and so on and so forth. And like I'd be, my head would be up because I'm trying to remember the verse and the reference. And then a girl walks by. And like now this thought comes in about, oh, look at that girl. <laughs> like, no, like, and I, I was getting beat up. At that point, like how, like, how can you, you're studying verses of the Bible and you're looking at a girl, like, like what's wrong with you? And again, you, you get defeated before you even defeated. And then I, I realized this, no, that, like the first glance is just a temptation. The second glance, that's where the evil desire is, is coming in. But again, the, fa the fact that that, that that is presented to you, that's not sin. But it, but, 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 it, but it should bring out a warning. Like it should bring up defensiveness in terms of, okay, now, now what am I going to do about this? Am I going to encourage this thought? Again, am I going to take a second look? Am I going to look a little longer the second time? Or maybe whatever it might be. Or again, I'm, I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to gossip, but then I want to gossip. And you know, I just c continue to make the phone calls and just continue to think about the thing that I'm gossiping about. Like it's... it's Sin is a penalty. Like sin is, is, is wide in terms of all the things that are offered to us. And, and, and temptation is a dynamic in every single one. And again, we have to be defended against those things. See, but one, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So it's after that desire has conceived, not, not, now that's when, 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 when sin act, actually happens. And I think it is a, it's an important distinction to make. Not, not, that we, not that we encourage evil desire. Not, not that we encourage temptation. Oh, temptation is not, not sin. Well, let me, let me like go in a place where I'm going to be exposed to all this temptation. You know, I'm an alcoholic and I don't want to drink, but I'm going to go to the bar because, you know, I, temptation isn't sin. I'm sitting at the bar and I'm looking at the drinks. I'm drinking club soda, but I'm looking at the drinks and I'm like, and the desire, oh, I, yeah, I have a desire for it, but I'm not doing it, Pastor. No, that, that, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, like, in other words, even though the reality is that it's only when you choose to participate and say, yes, I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to foster the thought. I'm going to continue in the path that it's leading me in. You know, that's when it becomes sin. But it doesn't mean we either encourage the evil desire or put ourselves in the place of temptation. In fact, I don't think temptation or sin should even be the focus of our life. 
Like we don't, we don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to sin today. Every time I'm tempted, I'm going to be aware of it, and I'm going to defend it, and I'm going to recognize the process. No. no. It's going to happen. Realize it's going to happen. You're going to be walking around. You're going to be doing your thing. Again, it, looking at, you know, just reflecting back on 1 John. I'm walking in the light. as Jesus in the light. I have fellowship with, with, with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses me from all sin. And, and that's what my focus is. My focus is Jesus. And now, okay, as I'm following Jesus, I'm, I'm trying to promote his will in my life. I'm in, involving myself with the disciplines of the Christian life and all those things. And then in the midst of that, the temptation comes. Oh, I recognize this for what it is. Well, we've been down this road before. Oh, yeah, me not receiving the forgiveness of God. I know what that's like. Me, me being discouraged of my insecurity and my disappointment, my discouragement, how lousy I am. Oh, yeah, I know what that sounds like. But now what does God think? What, what, what do I know in terms of what God has said? But bo both in terms of his person, his provision, as well as his plan. I mean, um, <clears throat> I mean, to recognize that the ultimate result of this sin, you know, it, it, it is a... a, a Intense picture here. Desire is conceiving. It's like a new being is, is, is being created here. You know, it's a desire has conceived. It gives birth to sin, and sin with is full grown gives birth to death. Like that is the, that is the ultimate goal. For, first, death that is about separation. D death that is about drawing you away from God and fellowship with Him. And then eventually physical, physical death if we continue to promote sin. In our life, that, that, is the, that is the part, that is the path that sin has. Just quickly, we can't talk about this without talking about God's provision in the midst of it. Why don't you just bring up the verse, Kelly, in terms of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This, is, this should be very comforting in terms of our recognition of facing temptation. Is no temptation is overtaking you except what is common to man. Again, don't be tripped up about how evil your temptation is. That, that's another tool that say, oh, like, like you're really, like you think that? You're the only one that thinks that, you know that? Like you, you're, you're the only one like that. No, no, no. Tempt, it's common to man. Like it might not be the person next door that has your temptation, but, but what Satan is working, you know, Satan is, Satan is not all-knowing, but he has been around for, around for a long time. So he, knew, he knows the human condition. He has seen your type before. Maybe hundreds and thousands of times. It, it knows how, he knows how to take, take your fear and twist it and, 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 and amplify it. He knows to take that insecurity. He knows that passion. He knows that desires. He knows that lust. He knows that pride. He knows that materialism. And he's, he's always... So again, it's common to man... And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. What did you talk about a promise? Like, I'm giving you a leg up. Like, oh, you know, you look one tempted, you know, and God isn't tempting you, okay, but evil desire and not what you can't bear. Now, what I will say and what I would add there is that you cannot bear it or beyond what you can bear with God's power. Like, 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 with being engaged with God, I'm not going to give you more than you can bear. Now, if you choose not to engage with God, you choose not to be in his word, you to, to decide not to access his power, then all of a sudden you're facing temptation on your own? <laughs> yeah, absolutely you'll be tempted about what you can bear because you can't bear anything. Realistically, in terms of godliness and promoting the work of God. But again, to realize that yeah, one day he's not like when you're facing when you are doing that and you are equipping yourself. Though, God, you're protecting me on the level of temptation. Now, now Satan is never going to tell you that. Satan is going to say, "Oh, you know something? By the way, I'm only tempting you as much as I you can bear." Just the opposite. He's saying you can't change this. You can't stop this. You can't think differently. But again, the reality is you can bear it. And when you are tempted, he will always provide a way out so, you could, so that you can endure it. Always a way, always another thing to think. 
Always another thing to say. Always another way to, do, way to go. Always, always another thing to do. Like if this is the thing that promotes this, like I, I do this thing, I'm in this circumstances, I'm, I'm in this condition, and boy, it always leads to this. Well, then find a different condition. Find a, create a different circumstance. Like, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do my best not to be in that. Like, always, it's always Friday night and it's always like this and I'm always doing this and, well, then stop doing that on Friday night. <laughs> do, do, do something else, something that is gonna encourage godliness. But you, I think you kind of get the point in terms of providing that way out. Our responsibility, again, you, you, when, when you talk about facing temptation, like to me, when you're facing temptation, you can't be running to the Bible to find that verse. Like it can't be, okay, here's a temptation. I'm in my car on 95. Where's my Bible so I can read? Oh, what's that? Pre no. So you have to understand that, that God desires for his law, his word to be written on your hearts. It is when you are so involved in the Word of God and the Word of God is renewing your mind and transforming your heart where now all of a sudden godliness is the default. It's a neat thing in a life of a maturing person, a maturing believer, when all of a sudden godliness becomes the default. So the point is not like, I mean, memorizing the, memorizing the verse does help to get it written on your heart. But it's not about, I run to the Bible to get the verse that, it's fine to do that in certain, but you get the, the, when I'm in the throes of battle, that verse has to be there. And the only way the verse is going to be there is that if the word is my food, it's the thing that's sustaining me. Like I'm involved with it all, well not all, the, but every day I'm engaging with the word of God. Every day I'm welcoming his thoughts into my head. So that now it becomes more normal and natural for me to think the way God thinks. And, and more normal and natural that I recognize a temptation. Like, no, you're lying to me. And I know you're lying to me because I know this is true. And again, so that, you know, remember the disciplines. Worship, the Word, the Holy Spirit, prayer, and the fellowship of believers. Again, if you're wondering... What should I do in my Christian life to have more godliness, to have more of God's influence in my life? Worship the Word, the Holy Spirit, prayer, and the fellowship of believers. I've been through that before, so that's why it's not on the slide. But um, that's what you do. And then, and then you grow in those things, and you grow in the influence of God. Now you're having victory over sin. You're recognizing temptation. You make sure it's not following the track where it becomes sin. And then all of a sudden you realize, you know something? I feel like there's a gift that I would want to give, like in terms of service. Like, I really like to encourage people, so I'm going to make sure I encourage people. I really like to serve. What does the church need? Does it need painting? Does it... You know, I, I really have a gift of leadership. So yeah, everyone wants to have a gift. Of, no, I'm joking. Sorry. There was a subtle joke in there. I won't go there. Um, but you get the point. You grow in your personal life, in your own holiness, your own godliness. Then all of a sudden, wow, I should be giving myself away. I should be serving in some capacity. And ju just the last three is, it's the, the three things that God asks of us that he will not make us do. Not that it will make us do anything, but the things that we offer God is faith, humility, and will. Like if you're facing temptation without faith, humility, or will, you're not going to be successful. Well, what's required in facing temptation, again, you have the faith. Like you have the knowledge of God and you have the willingness to believe what God has said. You have the humility to recognize it's not about me, it's about God. It's not about what I want, it's about what God wants. And you have the will to say, I have to choose. See, if there's anything, if there's anything James is telling us, is you have to choose. You have to realize that it's on you to make the right choice. God has given you all these resources, but you're dragged away and enticed. You allow sin to give birth. 
You, it's you, you did it. Our greatest enemy is us. And I, and I would say if you're not, so when I said that in testing and temptation, success and failures can still be valuable. Like if you're failing, well then look, what, what's faltering? What am I missing? Am I missing faith? Am I missing humility? Am I missing will? And then now let me garner up my will and my choices and my strength and my conviction and my knowledge of God. So now, now what am I going to think? Now, what am I going to do? And so, like I said, even though God is ultimately and unconditionally forgiving of us, that he would want us to engage with the knowledge of the process that we're involved in either avoiding sin or promoting sin in our life. And the choice will be ours with him making his provisions to help us. Amen? Let's bow and let's pray. Father, I, I do believe that you have an awesome plan in terms of what you desired this Christian life to be. To, to know that, that that would involve Satan and sin being able to tempt us is on purpose. And then, Father, what you desire to develop in us in terms of obedience, godliness, spiritual influence, recognition of spiritual power to overcome, and even having our faith sharpened, our faith being shown as genuine because we are overcomers, because we think differently. And so, Father, I just, I just do pray that you continue to build this up in you, that, that, that we continue to pursue you in your word and in worship and in your spirit and in prayer and in the fellowship of believers. And so, Father, in, in all, I, I just pray that we are further enlightened in terms of the nature of temptation, how we are tripped up and the responsibility we have to not be tripped up. Help us to believe. Help us to see what, what gaps exist in terms of the, our faith, our humility, or our will. And so we lift this all before you with the understanding that now as we celebrate communion, we, we, we recognize the sacrifice that was made to make this all possible. And, and, and to secure us in relationship even as we are engaging with things like this. And so we lift that before you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.